now we're going to start our chapter on learning. This is in some ways the most important and interesting aspect of the entire uh, framework, which is essential because as we said at the very beginning, the brain is too large and too complicated to be built by hand. It has to be something that develops on its own through essentially autonomous mechanisms operating in individual neurons, locally, in the brain, everywhere, that organizes somehow magically this, this knowledge has to emerge out of these interactions among all these individual neurons. These kinds of self-organizing mechanisms literally take on a life of their own. They're very complex, they're hard to understand. Um, this is really where the magic occurs because again, the, the system is building itself. Okay, so our exploration of learning starts as usual with the biology and we'll look at what we know about how these synapses between neurons, these individual connections, change as a function of the activity of the neurons. And from there, we're gonna to try to understand those mechanisms at a biological level to a sufficient level of detail that we think we can now constrain our understanding of the uh, different mechanisms at work in learning. And we can identify two computational level ideas, self-organizing learning, which amounts to essentially sort of learning based on the overall statistics of the ex environment that the network is being exposed to. And then error-driven learning, which can be distinguished from self-organizing learning because it is targeted directly at getting the overall behavior of the system to function in some more specified way. It's actually using performance of the system itself as a way of training the way the system is shaped. And that kind of performance contingent learning enables the brain to really adapt in ways that are, are much more uh, targeted towards the things that are working and the things that aren't working and really fixing those errors, those things that aren't working directly. Whereas self-organizing learning is simply kind of, you know, locally computing these sort of statistics that may or may not be actually that useful in terms of shaping the behavior of the organism itself. People have separately investigated these two different types of learning in a, in a not large number of computational models over the years. And what we found in our research is that actually combining both of those two forms of learning tends to work better than either one alone. But we'll start by looking at each one separately and then show how we can understand the benefits of integrating them. First of all, the initial discovery that synapses actually do change their strength in response to patterns of activity was discovered by Bliss and Lomo in the early 70s. This really started the whole neuroscience uh, field of synaptic plasticity. There was work before this that had shown some amount of short-term changes in synaptic strength, but there had not been prior to this work any demonstration of a longer lasting form of synaptic change. And that longer uh, form of learning was considered, of course, to be essential to account for memory, which is behaviorally quite long lasting, as we know. This was known at that time as long-term potentiation to contrast with the shorter forms of, forms of potentiation that had previously been demonstrated. These, you can see the time scale here is on the scale of hours. Um, so this is an infrequent probing of the strength of the pathway and it's measured through this thing called the excitatory postsynaptic potential or EPSP. This is a very commonly used uh, term in neuroscience drove the system with this big, massive burst of activity, really blasted the brain um, with a large amount of uh, neural firing, 250 hertz. If you remember, we talked about 100 hertz as kind of the maximum normal level of firing of neurons in the brain. And they did this for a solid 200 milliseconds, so quite a long time. And what you see is that prior to this tetanic stimulation, you get you know a particular uh, overall magnitude and slope of the rise of this uh, overall EPSP. 
and that after that you get this higher overall level of uh, excitatory potential in other words a greater level of voltage in the neurons that you're recording from that have been excited um, and in fact the slope is also higher and it turns out the slope is sometimes a more sensitive measure and so that's often used here so this is the slope of the rising phase of this part of the curve and so uh, this demonstration that by really strongly driving the system this changes the overall excitatory postsynaptic potential in this pathway in a way that lasts up to four hours at least in this particular demonstration this was actually done in a dish of separated uh, brain tissue that's a very commonly used preparation in the synaptic plasticity studies in order to get real control over the pathways involved um, but this uh, we now know lasts essentially for a very long time, but there are additional uh, mechanisms that come in at this longer time scale. We won't really go into those too much in this class. Since that initial demonstration in the 70s, there's been intensive research by a number of labs over, over the years that has resulted in a very complete understanding at this point of what is actually going on at the synaptic level and the chemical level to drive this synaptic plasticity. We're going to look again at the diagram of the synapse to remind we the basic pattern of neurotransmission involves the release of these vesicles of glutamate, the neurotransmitter. It diffuses across the synaptic cleft, binds to the AMPA receptors. The AMPA receptors open up and allow sodium ions to enter the postsynaptic cell and thereby exciting it. What happens during plasticity is some change in that overall cascade. And if you just look at this diagram, you can sort of imagine many different possible changes. You could increase the amount of neurotransmitter that's released. You could increase the number of AMPA receptors. You could in increase something about the way that the neurotransmitter interacts with the, neuro with the receptors. All kinds of things could happen, and in fact, the history of this field shows that in, in, indeed many different things change over time in response to uh, repeated activity across, this indivi across an individual synapse. Nevertheless, the primary mechanism that has been identified as like the main driver of, of long-term potentiation is changes in the number of AMPA receptors. And so this is diagrammed here. We now know the whole cascade of events that lead to this change in the number of AMPA receptors. And as should be hopefully clear, if you increase the number of AMPA receptors, then you increase the uh, number of channels where sodium ions can get through. And conductance is literally just the size of that pipe, the number of open pipes essentially effectively that allow those sodium ions to get through. And so that is gonna increase GE, the, the conductance across the uh, membrane, allowing these sodium ions in. The events that, that unfold that result in the increase in number of AMPA receptors are as follows. First, you have to have an increase in the membrane potential of the postsynaptic neuron. So the postsynaptic neuron has to be getting some kind of input already through other AMP uh, channel receptors, for example, on other, dendrite, on other spines on the dendrite, causing the overall cell to be excited. This causes magnesium ions that are otherwise lurking uh, and blocking the openings of these NMDA receptors um, it causes those ions to, to get pushed away a bit and unblock these NMDA receptors. And you can see that the magnesium ions have a positive charge. And so when you increase the membrane potential here, you're, you're decreasing the attraction of those magnesium ions to the negative charge within the cell. Next, you need to have the neurotransmitter released so that you actually get glutamate coming across but glutamate doesn't only bind to AMPA receptors, it also binds to the NMDA receptors. And so that binding to the NMDA receptors is the, the, the critical additional element that opens up those channels and allows calcium to enter the postsynaptic cell. 
And so NMDA is more permeable to calcium than other ions, whereas AMPA is more permeable to uh, sodium ions. And so this calcium turns out actually in cells throughout the body to be a very important modulatory or regulatory kind of control uh, ion that sets off cascades of uh, chemical processes in the postsynaptic cell. And there are these mechanisms called kinases. There's a process of phosphorylation, um, all these different kinds of uh, well-known chemical cascades that operate in cells um, that are activated by these calcium ions entering. And we've just kind of summarized those with the letter X here. We'll go into a little bit more detail later um, for those who are interested about exactly what's going on with that. But the net result, which is all we care about at this point, is that there is an increase in the number of AMPA receptors that get kind of squirted out across this membrane. And one thing to keep in mind that's very important is that this membrane, although we saw it with this kind of heavy black line here, it looks like it's a kind of solid thing, is actually extremely squishy. It's just like this little kind of fatty thing. And it's really actually pretty easy to squirt these little protein blobs, these little, channel, uh, these little channels out through that membrane. And therefore, um, that is the mechanism. Um, there's actually a, an additional um, protein uh, structure that's made of actin fibers, which is very much the same fiber that's present in your muscles, um, very interestingly. So your brain, in some sense, is actually a kind of muscle. And in fact, by exercising that muscle, by having activity going across the synapse, you're actually strengthening the brain muscle. And so these skeletal muscles, these actin fibers, form a kind of matrix that it enables the, uh, the whole spine to be stabilized. And that, that scaffolding, that kind of structure there, is actually what enables these AMPA receptors to be stabilized and poking out um, outside the lipid membrane. So there's a very recent line of research that's understanding all of those processes as well. Uh, that's critical. The other thing that, that is also operating that, that plays an important role is these voltage-gated calcium channels. These are channels that are not directly activated by a uh, neurotransmitter, and they provide a mechanism for entering for calcium to enter the cell as a function directly of the postsynaptic membrane potential and not taking into account the presynaptic levels. There's also metabotropic glutamate receptors that also get bound from the released neurotransmitter, the glutamate, um, and they also play an important regulatory role in, in modulating the uh, overall postsynaptic processes, uh, changing the AMPA receptor level. So it's quite a complicated system. There's many factors at work. A lot of the research published over the years has shown, oh, this factor is important, this factor is important. There's a, there's a certain amount of redundancy, there's a certain amount of complexity in the system but it is something that is actually very well understood at this point, at least by the people who know how it works.